we're live. Okay, just give me a second while I come. Sergeant Katowski, please start your recording. Recording started. Good afternoon. Welcome to New York City Council's remote committee hearing on youth services. Everyone, please turn on your videos at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair Rose. We're ready to begin. Thank you. I wanna thank you all for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue. My name is Debbie Rose and I'm the chair of New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is conducting an oversight hearing on nonprofit contracting. I'm really great, I'm really happy to announce that we are joined by council members Chin and council member Riley. At today's hearing, the Committee on Youth Services will examine the process for the city's contracting with nonprofit providers for the provision of youth services and will explore ways to improve the process to better engage and support youth focused community based organizations in New York City. The committee will also solicit feedback from advocates, providers, and community members about the issues plaguing the nonprofit contracting process and how to address them. COVID exacted a particularly heavy toll on our children and youth and at a critical developmental stage of their lives. This elevated the already enormous value of the work and the role of our nonprofit youth service providers whose efforts during the pandemic and in its aftermath can only be described as heroic. They, however, have been laboring under the burden of a number of challenges, such as the following. One, COVID-induced inflation and necessity to implement new health and safety measures increase youth service providers' costs. However, their contracts Re their contract reimbursement rates have not kept pace. Youth focused nonprofit providers have been struggling to recruit and retain youth workers because of inadequate wages and benefits, childcare issues, the background check backlog, and the consequence outflow of youth workers to better compensating DOE jobs and even to other industries in the private sector. Staffing shortages have been adversely impacting participants' enrollment because youth-focused providers have been straining to meet the participant to staff ratios. This means that our providers cannot serve as many youth as they should, as should be possible. And fourth, there are delays in payments to youth providers for already rendered services and the attendant lack of communication and clarity as to the payment timeline. This puts our youth focused nonprofit providers in a financial crunch, forcing them to resort to bridge loans, which is not a sustainable strategy. These burdens make the work of our nonprofit youth providers more challenging than necessary. And by extension, they mean fewer services for fewer youth, precisely at a time when our children and youth sorely need such services to address the social, emotional, and academic fallout of COVID. This is simply unacceptable. 
these problems can and should be addressed to ensure adequate and timely support of our youth focused nonprofit providers in their work. And the importance of this work is to our recovery and our collective future cannot be understated. Our advocate using one advocate used the following analogy to describe the effort of youth nonprofit providers during COVID and in its aftermath. Navigating a formidable storm at sea in a small rowboat with only one oar. She pointedly said, if providers could do such a great job with such inadequate tools, imagine what they could do with better support and resources. I, I could not say it any better myself. We can and must do much better than to hand our youth providers one oar in the COVID storm. We can and must come together in meaningful ways to ensure that our youth nonprofit providers are adequately supported in their critical work. This goes post COVID, this should be always, because what is on the line, but only our children and youth are not only our children and our youth, but our hope and our future. Because as Nelson Mandela put it, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. In summation, we are here today to examine the process for the city's contracting with nonprofit providers for the provision of youth services and to explore ways to improve it, to better engage and support youth-focused community-based organizations in New York City. In addition, we will hear feedback of the providers, advocates, and community members. I wanna take this time to thank the staff behind the scenes who will make sure that this remote hearing runs smoothly. And I'd also like to thank the Youth Committee staff for their work on this issue. My, community, my committee counsel, Amy Briggs, my committee policy analyst, Anastasia Zemina, and committee finance analyst, Michelle Peregrin. I wanna say a big thank you to all of you, as well as my staff, my chief of staff, Christine Johnson, and my legislative aide, Christine Ravello, and I want to give a shout out and congratulations to my legislative director, Issa Cortez, who gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And with that, I would now like to acknowledge my colleagues, I guess once again, <laughs> who have joined us, and they are Council Members Chen and Council Members Riley and Council Member Lewis. Um, and I will now turn it over to our committee council who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. I'm Amy Briggs, counsel to the Committee on Youth Services, and I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. And after you're called, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name, and I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes, and council members, please note that this will include both your questions and the witnesses' answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing, and these will, those will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your questions and your answers. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. And for public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. And after I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant announce, Arms to announce that you may begin. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Daryl Rattray, 
who's the DYCD Associate Commissioner, Dana, Dana could tell me, DYCD's Agency Chief Contracting Officer, and Ryan Murray, Mock's First Deputy Director. I will administer the oath to all three of you, and after reading, after reading the oath, I will call upon each of you individually by name to respond to the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the committee and to repeat, respond honestly to council member questions? Associate Commissioner Rattray? Thank you. Um, Agency Chief Contracting Officer Dana Katalep could tell me? I do. Thank you. And First Deputy Director Ryan Murray? I do. Thank you. Associate Commissioner Rattray, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I am Associate Commissioner Darrell Rattray, and I am joined by our Agency Chief Contracting Officer, Dana Cantelmi, and Ryan Murray, the first Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Contracts, otherwise known as MOTS. On behalf of Commissioner Bill Chong, thank you for this opportunity to discuss nonprofit contracting. And Chair Rose, thank you for your opening. Our nonprofit providers are truly heroes and the backbone of New York City. And we strive to do everything in our collective power to support them, whether it's ensuring they have both oars or even if it means getting into the raft with them to support the work that they do. Contracting is often an overlooked yet essential part of how the city serves New Yorkers. This is particularly important in human services where millions of New Yorkers rely on the essential programs offered by thousands of dedicated nonprofit organizations. Over the past eight years, DYCD has practically transformed across the program areas and grown from $400 million to over $1 billion, representing 63,000 contracts and amendments. As you will recall, this be began with the launch of Universal Sonic middle, middle School Programs within nine months of this administration, over 271 new after-school programs were launched through HHS Accelerator. As of today, there are nearly 900 campus programs operating citywide. Our procurement systems help manage the growth of our portfolio of Mayor Dinkins' signature beacon programs from 80 to soon to be 92 sites and a budget of 59.5 million. We have the 92nd site opening this January in Council Member Riley's district at Truman High School. Um, we expanded programming for residents of public housing through the Cornerstone Community Center Program. We began at 25 locations in 2009 and now offer services at 99 developments and a budget of $57.4 million. We have more than tripled the number of residential beds, increased the age for residential services to 24, and opened new drop-in centers. There are currently eight DYCD-funded centers with at least one 24 our drop-in center operating in each of the five boroughs. During this time, the council's investments in discretionary funded programs grew from 29.6 million to 87.67 million in fiscal year 2021 and 119.6 million and counting in fiscal year 2022. COVID-19 amplified the importance of our work with new programs and services rolling out quickly to respond to the unprecedented health crisis and shifting needs and made it clearer than ever the need to digitize procurement through Passport. In the past year and a half, we launched three major initiatives to help the city recover. SYP Summer Bridge, Learning Labs, and Summer Rising. SYP Summer Bridge was offered an engaging virtual program that provided young people opportunities to learn new skills, explore potential careers, and earn money. During the height of the pandemic, our staff worked tirelessly with DOE, DDC, FDNY, DOB, DCAS, MOX, and other agencies to launch Learning Bridges, which provided free childcare options for children through the K and through eighth grade. Finally, this past summer, we launched Summer Rising, a comprehensive summer program during the most critical summer for New York City students. Summer Rising provided enriched, comprehensive summer camp style programs and services to children throughout New York City. Summer Rising also ensured that students assigned to summer school as well as all that participated, received enhanced academic services that were vital in helping to bridge the learning gap as we turned the corner from the pandemic. The program operated five days a week for seven weeks across 
close to 800 programs. We are incredibly proud of DYCD staff, our providers, our young people and families during these challenging times. Since the pause order was enacted in March, 2020, DYCD staff quickly adapted to working from home, from supporting, reimbursing and communicating with funded programs so they can best serve their communities. This was possible because the IT staff has developed systems and reports to help with the COVID-19 response and kept systems up and running to allow finance and contracting staff to support nonprofits during the crisis. Our community-based organizations have gone above and beyond in helping the city meet one of its top priorities during the COVID-19 emergency, which is keeping New Yorkers safe. We are pleased that our offices are open and staff are working in person while in September, our after-school programs and community centers welcome back young people. We appreciate our partnership with MOX as we move over to Passport. Our fiscal unit has been working diligently to enter contract actions as well as to provide cash flow. Since the start of the pandemic in March 2020, we processed over 4,500 contracts with 4,452 registered and 125 currently at the Comptroller's office. We are pleased to report that DYCD continues to have one of the fastest invoice and payment processing times. Thank you once again for this opportunity to testify today. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Chair Rose for questions. Chair. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, um, Associate Commissioner Rat Ray, for, um, for your testimony. And I want to thank everybody who's here from the administration to testify today. Um, the contracting process is very important process that's uh, uh, key and critical to the quality of service delivery that our not-for-profit um, providers can um, deliver to help them deliver services. So um, it, it's really important that uh, we get some answers to some of these to these questions, so that we can ensure that our young people are getting the resources that they need at the level, um, at at the necessary levels. Um, so. Uh, uh, what is the typical timeline for the completion of the contracting process from pre-solicitation to payment? Thank you, Chair, for the question. So I'm going to give you a timeline of, of happy path, right? From solicitation to contract registration, you're looking at anywhere between six to nine months, and that's taking into account all of the required steps um, you know, that we have to follow as part of the procurement policy board rules. Okay, um, could you tell me what um, what the process is and the timeline for um, a typical RFP? So it, it really depends on the size and the scope, right? You can have an RFP that's a small budgeted amount, right? And that one we can get done depending on, again, the, the scope of, of the service and whether or not we are having a concept paper, you can get that done within, I wanna say nine months. But if you have something of a large scale, such as like our beacon compass program, that's going to take a long time that we usually say it's about 18 months because we want to ensure that we're getting the feedback from the community, the participants, the public, uh, our council members, right, to ensure that we're meeting the needs of New York City. Um, with with the um, uh, the you said the eight the um, compass is uh, pretty much an 18 month process. Would that be the same for Sonic? Sonic too. I mean, so when we, the last time that we released the Compass and Sonic RFP, we released them together. Um, unfortunately that was canceled, right? But we would look to release them together. So it would, because Compass is the comprehensive, that's the umbrella and mm -hmm. Sonic is a, a portion of the Compass overall program. And the, the increase in the time frame um, for, uh, for the RFP process for a Compass and Sonic, uh, which is different from the pre-solicitation um, process to payment. Is it because of the concept paper? Um, concept paper. Part of that process? What, what adds, what adds sure. time on to this process from the, what makes it different from the pre-solicitation 
uh, process to payment? Sure. So it's it's really the the large volume, right? You have a large number of sites, which you know when we release these RFPs, we do get a large volume of proposals. So the evaluation process. Also, there's a large partnership that happens with DOE and the principals, where providers have to engage with the principals as part of their proposal process. So we need to ensure that we're building in time for them to respond um, to the RFP. So. You know, what I'm describing right now is really the RFP phase, but once we move from the RFP phase to the award phase, that's when we're getting into the contracting piece of it. So finalizing contract negotiations, the budget, the work scope. Again, Compass is, a, is our largest <laughs> program, right? We're talking about hundreds of, of contracts as a result of Compass and Sonic um, for DYCD to process. So, and also for the providers, right? They're also dealing with having to process these budgets and, and work scope. So it does take a lot of time for them to get that, that through the system. So you are looking at a larger um, processing time when you're talking about a, a program such as Compass and Sonic. Can you walk us through the, the steps of, of the Compass uh, Sonic process? Sure, sure. Um, so starting first, I'm gonna break it up in phases. So starting first with the pre-solicitation phase, right? That would entail our stakeholder engagement concept paper, where we're engaging with the public, showing, giving folks time to um, comment on the model and also finalizing scope of, of work and what we want to release in the um, RFP. Then from when the time that we move from the pre-solicitation phase, we get into the solicitation phase, right? That's the RFP being released. We're having our pre-proposal conference. We're engaging with providers, informing folks, encouraging them to apply. We're also working closely um, with DOE to ensure that the principals are informed that this program is out. And then we close that solicitation phase and move into the evaluation phase where we're evaluating all the proposals that have come in um, and, and scoring them. Then we move to the award phase where we're actually selecting the um, new providers and then moving into contract. And just, uh, to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Chair Rose, just to add to that, and during this time, you know, our team here at DYC, we were working with the nonprofits to both develop the detailed um, scope of what they're actually going to be doing on site. So what, what are the activities going to look like? What's the quality of those activities? Um, what's, what's your budget? So we're working with them to get a, a final secure budget that's part of that contract package, uh, working with them about their staffing. Are you hiring the right staff? What the qualifications are? Um, and then working with the director of that site or coordinator to ensure that the right conversations are happening. If you're school-based, are you having those conversations with the school administration, um, other community stakeholders, et cetera? And then um, once we go into the contracting, that's where you see your responsibility termination process, right? We're doing a review of the awarded contractor to ensure that they're responsible. We're doing our vendor name checks. We're making sure that we have all of our oversight approvals, and then we're sending it to the controller's office for registration, at which point, once registered, the provider can then get their uh, advance and, and start submitting for reimbursement. Um, can you uh, tell me, um... Under um, at, at what role do the stakeholders and advocates play in the Compass and Sonic RFP process? And um, what role does the Human Services Council play in that process? So definitely, um, and we've done this in the past where we work with the council members during the stakeholder engagement process. So, you know, reaching out, whether it be through surveys, having meetings um, to discuss what you may see as an ideal model, what may have to change um, with our models um, and taking all that feedback into consideration to help develop the RFP. We try to do stakeholder engagement prior to a concept paper release, during a concept paper release, and even at times after um, to ensure that the RFP really reflects, you know, a, a holistic model of, of what's needed for, you know, all of our stakeholders. Okay. Um, and under which RFPs are the current Compass and Sonic provider contracts? And are these the most recent? So there's a combination. So our, our oldest contracts are off of the 2012 RFP. That was a combination of elementary and middle school programs. And then when we had the expansion, the, the Sonic middle school expansion, that was, I wanna say 2014, Daryl, you can correct me. 
if I'm getting that wrong, um, sure. 2014 was the middle school expansion contracts, and that was primarily Sonic. Um, then we also had another subset, I want to say in 2016, where we had some additional um, elementary and middle school, as well as center-based programs. Um, uh, why, um, why have uh, the current RFPs not been issued? Yeah, so unfortunately, due to the pandemic, our timeline was delayed. We were hoping to start stakeholder engagement with the public right around the time the pandemic started. So we are, we unfortunately had to move that timeline back. Um, but definitely during the new administration, that's one of our first priorities to start that process. And in, in, in September of 2018, however, you, um, DYCD informed current, you know, providers of, um, Compass or and prospective providers of Compass and Sonic that the RFPs for these programs that were due in October 2nd of uh, 2018, they were canceled. Why were these canceled? Um, they were canceled due to advocacy, I believe, of the nonprofits. We wanted to ensure that we were taking a closer look at the model. Um, when we released that RFP, there weren't any changes to the model. Um, so, you know, we felt confident with the RFP that we released, but after further, you know, consideration and hearing from our nonprofit providers, we felt that we wanted to take another look and see where we could improve. And you, um, uh, so then you felt that the, the input that you got from the uh, providers warranted taking another look yes yeah and um can you just kind of tell me uh how long you're looking <laughs> it, it's well, been 2018 <laughs> um, what's taking so long of, as dana mentioned earlier one of the things that happened honestly was we started the new stakeholder engagement to get more detailed conversations happening around what the concerns were and then we got the pandemic happen. So that it kind of pushed that plan back. So at this point, given the timeline, we are looking forward to the new administration coming in um, and starting that process back up, which will also be informed by the new administration and the new direction. So um, so now that we are, we're sort of uh, semi back to, you know, mm -hmm to getting you know back to a place where we were um pre-covid um what is the timeline now for the the uh, issuing of the rfp so we anticipate releasing the rfp in 2022 the, the current compass programs run until end of fiscal year 23. um so stakeholder engagement happening during the new calendar year. And then again, because of the scale of the Compass RFP and the number of proposals we anticipate and the number of sites, we wanna ensure that we're allowing the nonprofit providers enough time to do their outreach, get their school partnership agreement signed. So it, it is a RFP that takes a longer time to get processed. So have, um, have the providers been informed that this, um, this RFP will be coming out? in 2022? So they've been informed that their contracts are running until June of 2023. We're in the process of extending all of them. Um, uh, this is a, a question that, um, I, this is just for my edification. Um, the, the, the extensions, is there no limitation to the number of extensions that you can you can provide before a new RFP is, is rendered? So there are, um, within the rules, there are um, parameters that you have to follow in order to extend a contract. Um, you know, for our Compass programs, we had, you know, because of the pandemic and also because we wanted to ensure that we had a solid model um, we were able to extend those contracts for a longer period of time. There's no defined number of extensions that were allowed. 
Um, but in terms of, of how long we could extend something, it's what's called a, a negotiated acquisition extension that allows us additional time to develop a, a, a new RFP. And these extensions are, are predicated on the original terms of the RFP, right? That's correct, the underlying contract, yes. And they don't take into consideration any sort of changes in, in, in anything. Well, if, if there were amendments you know, that added funding to those contracts, they would be rolled over as well into the negotiated acquisition extension. It wouldn't be their original base that was awarded off of the uh, initial RFP. So providers and advocates you know, report that their contract reimbursement rates have not kept pace. So what, what's being done to address that? So I know the city, you know, we've invested in the nonprofit community through the indirect rate um, increases that have been giving for FY20 and out. Um, you know, one of our goals through the stakeholder engagement for the new Compass programs is to see what that new price is. But in terms of the current contracts, the increases that we've seen um, have been around the indirect rate. Yeah, and council members, uh, good, yes. af good afternoon. Um, Hi. Ryan Murray from Mox. Hi, good to see you again. Um, this is really important, right? We've heard this repeatedly from the sector, uh, not just in Utah. Sorry, could you speak up a little? Could you speak sure. up a little? I can't quite hear sure. you. Sure, can you hear me okay now? That's better. Great. Uh, what I was saying is that this is a very, uh, this is something that the sector overall, not just youth services, is advocating for. So we were the first uh, in the nation to really step into the space of looking at the indirect rates to make sure that folks are funded more wholly um, in terms of all the administrative costs that you have to run a contract. Um, for the youth services portfolio, um, this is something that we're going to have to look at very, very closely. Um, I've been at many hearings uh, with Councilmember Chin and you and Councilmember Kalos, where the sector has absolutely said, look, you know, here the cost and the of our staff is changing. Uh, they're advocating for colas and such. Uh, that is something that is actively being looked at and something that would have to be considered as we're looking at the new R RFP um, and service delivery moving forward. So it's something that's absolutely on the radar. Uh, we're working with advocates. We're hearing their feedback. Um, one contribution we have, as Dana said, is in the indirect rate, um, but we know that there's advocacy for more. Um, thank you. Um, uh, when, when we look at the, the rate, uh, like $3,200 a year per student, um, you, we all can recognize that that is woefully inadequate. And, um, and so um, when we're having programs administer uh, services to young people at a rate that you know hasn't changed in um, in more than say five years, uh, knowing that the costs have have gone up exponentially, um, even with the indirect. And I want to I want to commend I want to commend this city council and the administration for recognizing that the indirect rate needed to be addressed. Um, you know, it, it it was a long time coming. Um, but it still isn't, you know, it, it isn't all that that is needed. Um, so um, I am really hard pressed to know, you know, what DYCD plans to do to ensure that the new RFP is a priority in the incoming administration, because um, I'm not going to be here to bug you. Um, but I, I really need to know what you're going to do to make this a priority. In, in the incoming administration. And I'd like to know what conversations or discussions have been had at City Hall, you know, thus far in regard to the new RFP. Who exactly in DYCD is leading the charge and ensuring that this remains a priority? And what conversations are transpiring with the providers to ensure the new Price, particip price per participant is captured, you know, um, supporting the service providers uh, contractual needs. And the last question is, what does DYCD estimate 
that that new price particip per participant will be for Compass and Sonic moving forward. I can I, I can ask them no, all no, I, I, this is one good, at a Cheryl, time. But I, this is good. Um, first, you know, really, I want to so know. For, yep, what, first and what, foremost, what, so first what and foremost, discussion? the discussion around it is with the new administration is going to be in our transition document. So um, every agency is creating a transition document that um, will set the priorities or speak to what we believe um, the priorities can, should be. And that will be the start of the discussion with the new administration. Um, and is this and this is clearly a priority in that transition document? Absolutely. Um, can you tell me about any conversations you've had prior to, you know, leading up to this point? So about the new RFP? There's been constant conversations and discussions, both with the nonprofit leadership as well as um, some of the associations, um, as well as City Hall, of course. Um, we were looking forward to starting that, that new phase of stakeholder engagement during the new administration. So everybody's having this collective conversation around what the race should be. And that's getting to sort of your last question on what we believe. Honestly, we we said we put a number in the RFP. We got we received some of the pushback against that. We pulled the RFP. We're not at a place yet where we're saying it should be this number. I think we need more input. We need more input from um, the nonprofit community. We need more input from the new administration. Um, I don't think it's going to take that long, but those discussions have to happen. You know, um, I, one of my concerns is how much weight does that input carry? You know, um, I've, I've heard from DYCD, you know, repeatedly that we, um, you know, we talk to our stakeholders, we talk to our providers, you know, in, in all the things from youth count to the COVID, you know, planning. Um, and, and what, uh, you know, what I want to know is that's fine to, to talk to them and have discussions, but what weight does it carry? How much, you know, does it actually um, benefit them to, or, or what is the outcome of, of some of those conversations? That, um, that is, because they did yeah. have conversations with you prior to the, the issuance of the RFP that you pulled back. So Chair Rose, definitely a great question. I personally, I believe it carries a lot of weight one indicator is the fact that we pulled the RFP back. Like based on that feedback we released, we, we released it at a rate that we believe was the right rate on average. And based on the feedback, we pulled it back. One example of, of how stakeholder engagement um, can support different rates. At one point, our Beacon portfolio per contract was down to, I wanna say 340,000 on average. And we had a lot of stakeholder engagement, focus groups. Uh, we had a concept paper. Then we had discussions around the concept paper with nonprofits. And we actually released the Beacon programs. Right now, they're about 602,000 each on average, somewhere in that area. So yeah, the, the input that we do receive from providers is meaningful and we do include it and we do take it into account. Um, and what role does the Human Services Council play in that process? The, again, another another stakeholder who reviews and we meet with and we discuss um, the details around what we're going to create and release on RFP. So um, could you tell me how you, um, so do you arrive at the budget model um, for Compass and Sonic contracts? If I would say data, unless you have details now in your head, I would say, Count Chair Rose, let me get back to you on the model makeup. It's been some time and I don't have it fresh in my head. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, that that is also still part of the stakeholder engagement plan. We're still trying to find what that sweet spot is, right? Because as Daryl mentioned, we released the RFP with an average that we felt comfortable was enough to cover the model. And there were folks that felt that it wasn't enough. So we pulled that back. Um, we did have some rounds of, of stakeholder engagement immediately after the RFP was canceled to get uh, model budgets from folks. And we didn't see the increase that 
that folks were asking for when we cancel the RFP. So uh, we just want to make sure that we get it right this time because the last thing we want to do is, is go through another process where we're canceling an RFP. So will they have the opportunity to give you some input um, uh, now that you're, you're going back and, and to the drawing board and reflecting? And, you know, and again, how much weight will that carry? It, it abs they, they absolutely will have the opportunity to give feedback. It does carry weight, but it, all, it also depends on the budget at the time and what we're working with. But it's part of that discussion and that negotiation. That needs that that act absolutely needs to happen. Um, I, I want to hear from um, the uh, deputy director of Mox uh, about this process and and you know input and and numbers and you know um, when a budget is presented, you know how much how much do you value or or put you know what is the weight that you put on the, the numbers that are, are presented to you for um, in these for these RFPs. Sure. So, Council Member, hopefully you can hear me okay now. Um, the uh, part of what we do with the RFP process overall or any solicitation, um, the agency we and OMB um, have to think about what the overall funding for the initiative is. All right. So that is that is a higher level look. Uh, that number uh, would be going to the agency, it would be allocated. Um, in terms of what uh, the agency then does, I think both uh, Dana and Daryl spent a bunch of time talking about how they would say, look, the, the median cost might be X, um, you could negotiate and propose um, X to Y, um, and then based on the solicitations, part of the evaluation process isn't with mocks, but it's at the proposal level, right, where um, an age, uh, pr a provider will say, I can meet this rate of participation that you're looking for with this quality of services, but for a higher rate that's fully loaded. Um, so the evaluators that are selected for the RFP, um, and obviously that's a closed process, they're looking proposal by proposal to see based on the scope of work, as Daryl said, uh, that they're going to be uh, implementing, is, is the budget uh, sufficient? Um, so there's the higher level process where you say this initiative um, is going to get X amount of funding. And then DYCD will, could say this RFP or negotiated acquisition solicitation um, can fund up to X amount of slots um, if you're looking at a median slot of whatever the price may be. But it, it really does come down to the end proposal. Um, where they're selecting based on quality, based on scope, and then they will say back to um, OMB, to their commissioner and to OMB and to us at the end of the day, um, here are the, select, there are the people we're proposing for awards. Um, the rates are, you know, again, X to Y, um, and this, this is the true cost now based on the collaborative process where someone's proposed and they've said yes or no based on quality and scope. That's really the process to get to the final answer. Um, I think if you, as you know very well from your many, many years of engaging with providers, um, the RFP will say that you have to reach certain milestones and then you're going to have providers who might uh, select, uh, will say, I have competency in a particular area. How they choose to fund um, the staff and staff those activities is a provider decision. So you're going to have some variability. But at the end of the day, DYCD, um, is responsible for making a decision on what is the real the proposals that they're going to select um, and the, the quality and the scope as Daryl and Dana said, and that goes forward to, to right. um, and the awards. Right. I, I'm, I'm not really talking about the individual RFPs uh, and, and the proposals. I, I'm really trying to get at who determines what um, what the final amount that that initiative or, you know, that program is going to be funded at, you know, um, we can suggest a per, 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 per participant rate. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and someone determines that we're only going to allocate X million of dollars or tens of millions of dollars for such and such, you know, I, I want to know who determines that and who decides what that per that what that actual per participant rate winds up being. And can we unmute Dana can tell me? 
she actually went on mute. I know she she's struggling over there. Hi, Dana. Better. Thank you. <laughs> and Chair, to answer part of your question, and then I, I think you may want to pick it up, but ultimately it comes down to a negotiation and discussion with OMB, with um, us, City Hall, um, around what the priority is, what we're hearing exactly. from stakeholders, what the feedback we're getting from nonprofits, mm -hmm. and also in the, a discussion around how much is in the budget. And that determines what that price is going to be. It worked out really well with Beacon programs, although I'm always going to push for more money for Beacons. But again, it's, it's a conversation that has to happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's, that, that is, that's the route that I'm trying to get to is yeah. that you know we have the conversations it seems as if everybody is at the table um and and the real figures are are being you know talked about but then the outcome is somewhat very different and so dana um i'm sorry i interrupted you no no, no i'm sorry chair rose um just to add i mean that's one of the importance of the stakeholder engagement too right i, I think that we want to make sure that we're reaching everyone the last thing that we want to do um is release something rfp right and then start hearing from folks right so we want to make sure that we're giving providers our our colleagues right whether it be folks over at doe um enough time to to give us what should the model be? What should the funding be, right? Because at the end of the day, DYCD ha is the one that's going up to bat to say, hey, this is the model. We believe that this is the funding based on all the feedback. So, you know, it's it's best for us to have as much information and, and support to for us to be able to go and say, this is how much a model should cost. Um, could you tell me what the delay is with the summarizing payments and um, will, when will they when will these payments be issued to the providers? Dana just went on mute you, again. You, you, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to touch that button anymore. Okay. Um. So summarizing. Um. The way the system, the contracting system, works is that we cannot process and register contracts simultaneously. And with so, the summarizing initiative, those were built on as amendments to existing contracts. A number of those contracts were added to our Compass portfolio that was seeing a negotiated acquisition extension. So those had to be registered first in order for us to start registering the summer rising contracts. Um, I'm happy to report that a large majority of the negotiated acquisition extensions have started hitting registration and the summer rising contracts have started um, being launched in Passport and budgets made available. So we're working to get that, that you know those contracts registered but again like we cannot move forward with summarizing amendments until previous actions are registered so so we have no idea of when the payments will be made no but but we have definitely been working with our providers who have registered contracts to advance them funds and if they don't have a registered contract we've been working with mocks to get them loans so if there are providers that are you know experiencing cash flow they should definitely reach out to us and we would definitely work with them to get funding to their organization and, and echoing what what dana said there should never be a situation where nonprofits saying we don't have funding we reach out to dycd and there's nothing we can do and we're not going to meet payroll no reach out to us immediately and we've worked with nonprofits every day on this um, and we will work with you to figure out how to get you cash flow up into the point that your contract is registered. Yeah, because we don't want an interruption in the services. Exactly. We, we want there to be consistency. Um, the providers and advocates, you know, talk about staff shortages in their youth programs and point to a number of contributing factors. Um, inadequate wages and benefits is, you know, number one. Um, the resulting flight of youth workers to better paying like DOE um, positions and um, vaccine mandates, childcare issues, and the background check backlog. Um, what, what are we doing to, to assist the providers in recruiting and retaining youth workers and about the background check backlog? So I, I would say a combination of things. Um... And it's a, it's a lot around this, starting with the pandemic. We, right before the pandemic, we were seeing a shortage of, what I, what I would say is quality. You, we're hearing from the field that we can't find quality youth staff and youth workers. 
And then once the pandemic hit, forget about it, we start to lose workers in general um, to other jobs or whatever was happening and folks were growing through. Um, we do do a series, I mean, in the past, we've done series of um, job recruitment fairs where we had providers, I mean, even recently, virtually tabling um, and folks were able to log in, um, go to different breakout rooms during a Zoom call, speak to different providers. Uh, we've assisted in that manner. It's it's something that we're trying to get a handle on, but um, what they're saying is true. There There isn't a ton of youth workers out there that are definitely having trouble recruiting and hiring staff. Is it, and I can't say it's always a wage issue because in, in, in one area, I just had a discussion around what I believe was a decent wage job that they were trying to recruit for and they were still having problem, problems recruiting for that job. So it's something that we're definitely taking a look at. We're working with providers on um, to get to the bottom of it uh, and hopefully build it up. Okay, because we're losing a lot to DOE for jobs that are sort of commensurate and, um, and, it, and it is because of wages. Um, and so uh, the, and we got to do something about the, you know, the fingerprinting process. Yeah. Uh, and, so and, yeah. Um, and I, I, I do want to give, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair Rose. Um, I, I do want to give, you know, my colleagues a chance to ask questions. Um, I just wanted to get a couple of those things out of the way. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Felice and um, Council Member Eugene. Um, I have uh, just a few other questions, but I, I will, I'll come back. I, I want to give my, my colleagues um, time to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will now call on council members in the order in which they have their hands raised in the Zoom function. Use the Zoom hand raise hand function. So council members, please remember that your questions, you have up to five minutes for your questions, and this will include both your questions and your witnesses' responses. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will be keeping a timer to let you know when your time is up. So we will now hear questions from council member Riley, followed by council member Chen. Council member Riley. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Council, and thank you, Chair Rose, for all the hard work you've been doing. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ass Associate Commissioner Rattray, um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I think I've been contacting you through my last professional with Speaker Hastie's office. Um, just a few questions, and excuse me if I cut you guys off um, due to the sake of time. Um, but kind of to bounce back on the question, uh, the answer you just gave for um, Chair Rose's question on the jobs that were given out and the wages. I think with today's youth and what they're kind of seeing and subjected to online, I came in, um, my first job was with Summer Youth. I worked in the library, I was a page. Um, I, I love my wage, even though it was probably like $7 at that time. But I love my little $96 check I used to get at the end of the week and I used to save it up. But the time, this time now is I didn't have social media back then. I didn't have things that were kind of shoved in my face, thinking I have to live up to a certain lifestyle. Um, so when we're thinking about the jobs and the opportunities we're given, I think we need to go to more career, career driven drop jobs, um, try to team up with um, providers such as like Google, um, kind of jobs that our, our youth are kind of interested in now where they could kind of pick up a career um, which is more interesting than just having a job for the summertime. I think then we'll get more youth. Um, but my, my, my question is, uh, when it goes to providers, especially when it goes to um, after school programs, um, I have a ton of um, nonprofits, local nonprofits uh, within my community that I know would do an amazing job uh, within the school system or with any um, any kind of programming that DYCD can help them with. But the issue is they're not getting the opportunities um, is what they're saying. Um, and I would love to kind of figure out moving forward because I will be here to bug you guys um, after um, Chair Rose leaves um, just to carry out her work. Um, but not bug you guys, but really just partner with you all because I definitely want to get more nonprofits locally, especially one that I have at um, John Philip Souza, which I want to connect with you. Um, but I know if the if the consensus of the community, principals, teachers, parents in the location would like a certain pro, um, provider in a location, um, and another provider is there, what is the procedure of kind of switching the providers out if they already have a, a contract or or that in place? So, Councilman Riley, I'll start with congratulations on, on your seat. Um, 
my first job was SYP, but I was getting paid like three dollars an hour. So you say <laughs> seven, that was like that seemed good for me. That was um, a rage. <laughs> but no, I, I definitely understand your point and, and hear you. And it's definitely something that we're speaking to folks about um, when it comes to youth weight, the wages that we have, um, how attractive a role in youth development is. Like when you know, when I worked at SYP and the work I was doing, and then I got connected to a beacon program as a kid. I didn't know it would lead to this job here as an associate commissioner. I just knew it was what I wanted to do to give back. Um, but we were looking at ways to better message out on um, the type of jobs that we can provide, but also make the connections to the other jobs that folks want. So we are working with other private entities um, on what SYP work sites look like, et cetera. But I, I, know, I don't wanna waste time. Um, one thing that we do that is like really important and we've done it in the past and we just did it for resident councils across the city. Resident council leadership asked, look, if a resident council wants to create an organization and run their own center, what do they need? So we've been having a series of um, workshops. If you're a small nonprofit, if you're a new organization, what does it mean to contract with the city, get connected to all, through all the systems and then compete on RFP? So I, I, I would start with that, actually. If you if there are some smaller organizations, maybe they need um, this sort of- I, will, I would love to connect with you to do that because I have, a, that is amazing. I didn't know that you guys did that. So yeah. if we could connect in a way to kind of bring it over here, because my whole vision is I'm trying to get more people in the community to actually be a part of the community in order to do so. They have amazing ideas, but they just need a way to kind of get these ideas going and, and up and running. And if we're going to have any say so or have any community uh, sense uh, with making them feel like they have a say so what goes on in the community, I feel like this is a great opportunity to at least try to make them start their own organization. So um, for the sake of time, I would love to connect with you outside of this. I, I know we didn't get to uh, meet um, personally, but definitely would love to connect with you outside of this and speak about this a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, for everything you have done for uh, for this committee. Thank you, um, Council Member Chen. Thank you, Council Member Eugene and Council Member Lewis um, and Council Member Feliz for your advocacy also for our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Riley. I will now turn to Council Member Chen for questions. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. You know, when you talk about summer youth program, my summer youth program, I will only pay a dollar and 60 cents an hour. <laughs> That was the late 60s. <laughs> so, you know, we've come a long way. Um, my question is that, uh, Deputy Commissioner, is that, you know, in the city council, we fund a lot of smaller group uh, through the discretionary grant. One question is like, you know, how fast can they get the money? I mean, some of them are so small as $5,000 and some, and, and this is the way that we sort of help them, you know, build up, uh, you know, their, their base so that they can in the future compete for a, a city contract. I mean, that is the goal. And that's what we do, you know, it's, it's also for our senior service. And I was really happy that in this RFP, in the recent senior RFP, a lot of the group that we have supported and funded got awarded, you know, for new senior center in New York. So that's what I'm looking you know, forward to in some of the group that, you know, Council Member Riley was talking about, you know, looking at the city council portfolio with all the smaller organization that contract through DYCD, how soon do they get the money? And like, what kind of technical assistance do you provide to them so that they know about the opportunity and be able to sort of build up their, the capacity so that they could one day compete for a city contract? And Councilman Chen, I'm going to pass it over to Dana. Okay, Dana. On yeah. how the, the, the timeline and the process from discretionary award to actual payout. Sure, thanks, Errol. So, um, and thank you, Councilmember Chen, for the question. So with discretionary, there's a number of factors that, that play. It, it really depends on when the provider's cleared, um, when they get their documents into us, if there's any responsibility termination issues, if it has to go to the controller's office for registration. Um, if you're a small organization, say receiving $5,000 and you're cleared and everything runs fine and we're able to register them in-house, um, they could see payment within two months of us actually getting the contract cleared and, and in, in 
house, like documents and, and contracts signed, um, registered, and then they would have to submit for reimbursement to get paid out. And I'll, I'll just add um, to the technical assistance question, uh, if you can hear me okay, Council Member Chen. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, DYCD, DYCD has historically spent a lot of time on capacity building, particularly for small nonprofits. So that portfolio is pretty robust. Um, thanks to Council Finance, actually, uh, and the Council, you've also invested in dedicated technical assistance for uh, particularly the smaller providers who might have a hard time like getting used to new technology and new processes. Um, so we've beefed up our services there as well. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done to make sure they're ready for RFPs, um, but we are definitely making sure that they can get through the, the discretionary process. And as Dana said, that can go pretty quickly depending on the size of award um, and a couple other factors. And obviously once the contract's registered, folks can get paid. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we also have been working ourselves in terms of you know, initiative to help uh, some of the nonprofit group to build their capacity and make sure they get all the document in place. I mean, that's why all of us have staff, you know, find, you know, uh, in our office and really work with these uh, groups since the uh, you know, beginning of the year to get them ready. Um, the other question I have is that, you know, oftentimes, you know, Councilman uh, Chair Rose has talked about, yeah, that we hear from advocate is that the reimbursement cost is always, you know, much lower than the actual cost. And one of the things that we didn't get through the last budget was the COLA increase. Are, you know, like in MOC or, or in DYCD, are you thinking about helping to sort of implement that or, or sort of have that bill in uh, so that the increase is automatic and then really to kind of help, you know, support these, lo these nonprofit organizations? Yeah, thank you for the question, Council Member. Uh, you, the, you know, as I spoke to earlier, um, you know, we looked at obviously funding for uh, contracts and making sure that we make them as whole as possible with the indirect rate. Uh, the COLA is something that we know very well. Our good friends, you asked about Human Services Council earlier, our good friends at Human Services Council have active campaign to make sure that this is on the radar for the outgoing administration as well as the incoming administration. So I don't want to get ahead of um, folks who will be here uh, in a few months, but it is something that we know is important and we know needs to be looked at. Time well, expired. Well, a lot of the council, I mean, council member Rose and I, we're, we're not going to be here. <laughs> yeah. We'll, but we'll you, be private you've been a, citizen. You've been I'm a strong gonna, advocate in this area. So yeah, I just want to acknowledge the council that member that's coming in and, and the council member here, they're going to continue our advocacy. That's what yeah. we're looking what, forward to. The, the one other thing I would just note on the mm -hmm. um, discretionary portfolio, um, thanks to many of you, I know Councilmember Riley, if he's still here, um, we did a training in uh, March um, just to, one of the big things with what we're doing digitally is making sure there's an increased transparency. So some of your questions about how long will it take to get from point A to point B, uh, your team members, as you said, now have access to Passport. You can yeah. see where things stand and you can, you help us in providing technical assistance to uh, providers uh, in the community who might be wondering where we are and what the next step is. So um, thanks to y'all for all the support, not just investing in capacity building for smaller nonprofits, but also for uh, keeping track and supporting directly. So thanks again. Yeah. No, we, it's a good partnership. I mean, we know that because we want to make sure they get the money, they get funded. We want to make sure they get the money out. Uh, so that's why I think it's, all, every council member has a budget director <laughs> just to deal with this. So, but thank you all for your support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chin. At this time, we have concluded the first round of questions. Chair Rose, if you'd like to continue with your, any other questions you may have, and we'll turn to other council members. Yes, thank, thank you so much, uh, Council. And, um, and I wanna thank my colleagues for those uh, insightful questions um, and, and their advocacy and their energy. Um, that's what makes this, uh, I think, the best committee in the city council because of the passion that, um, that we see displayed uh, with the committee members. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, if, um, if the model um, that you're, you're considering um, is going to change in a new, um, do you have any idea of how the model is going to be changed in a new RFP 
Um, and, uh, and if you, do you have an idea of what the per, per price per participant will be for Compass and Sonic? Not, not, not yet, not yet. We don't, not, yeah, not, I think, I think part of it is, okay. if you want to go with what we were thinking, well, that was the RFP. And I think it, that's all going to, I mean, I'm not saying it's all going to change that. 90% of the model is going to remain the same in what we do, but there are details around that, that are definitely going to change with the stakeholder engagement that we're going to proceed on. And if the RFP isn't going to be let until um, 2023, um, are there going to be any um, like updates to the provider's budget in the in, in the interim, you know, so or? Um, so the RFP will be, just to clarify, the contracts will start July 1st of, of 2023, um, but to answer your question, um, I think that that's definitely something that we would have to discuss with the new administration. Um, it's too early for us to, to answer yes or no. And, um, and all of these things are, are being actively discussed as well as being committed to the transition document. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, is it possible for um, for uh, for me to um, to get a copy of this transition document? Because I too am having conversations with sure. the new administration, incoming administration, as well as I, I probably want to talk to you also uh, before I get out the door. Chair Rose, you know me by now. I'm highly transparent. I don't know the protocol on that. Let let me look into it. If if it's possible, then absolutely. If if there's an issue, we'll give you the not like, hey, there's an issue. But we'll, we'll I'll definitely look into it. Okay, and I'll just have to come to the office and see. <laughs> if you're standing right here while it's open, <laughs> I'll look over your shoulder. Okay. Right, we're gonna strike that from the record. Okay. <laughs> All right, and um. You know, I, I just want to kind of circle back to the, you know, aforementioned um, staffing issues, you know, that make it difficult for um, for uh, the providers to meet the participant to staff ratios, and you know, and that that in, impacts their enrollment, um, and you know, uh, they're not able to meet their goals, you know, and may adversely affect, you know, their contracts. This really um, doesn't seem fair. Um, what can be done to address that concern? So two things, and I'm, I'm also, because I'm multi I'm trying to find that number. I want to say we had roughly, coming off of the mandate execution, we had roughly 150, 155 of our programs that said to us, listen, we're trying to find staff. Some staff didn't want to get vaccinated, so they can't be in a program. We're looking for other staff, but what that means, DYCD, is we're not going to be at 100% of our enrollment day one like you want us to. We're going to have to stagger the enrollment. Um, so part of what we're doing is allowing that to happen and giving um, leniency, if you will, and, and, and the ability and flexibility for providers to, to tell us that and do that. And we're not at the, you know, eight months from now, when folks forget that that happened, we're coming at them saying, oh my God, you weren't at full enrollment. No, we're gonna remember, we're gonna assist them and try to support. Okay, um, and, and that's been communicated to them? Absolutely. Okay, um, and the providers and advocates, you know, uh, report problems of, of how DYCD interacts with them um, and that there's a, a, a lack of uh, clarity um, they feel the communications are inadequate and delays in responding to whatever their questions, concerns, or issues are. You know, what are we doing, you know, to support these providers to increase, you know, um, this process? You yourself are a big advocate of transparency. Um, how is it that, you know, this becomes a, a recurring theme, regardless of, of what the topic for, for this committee has been with DYCD, 
this is always there's always this you know it's the um elephant in the room it, it's it's always it's even more than that it's always you know brought up as a bone of contention that you know the the communication the lack of communication the the lack of expediency in in responding um especially uh in major issues like we saw that with um with covid and um and with the youth count and um things of that nature what can we do or what is being done to to improve this um it just it just keeps happening and and, and i know dycd admin they always tell me that you know they're in the room they're at the table you know how is it that if, if they're at the table that they're feeling um, so disconnected and disjointed? Is it that they're at the table and they're not being heard? Um, they're um, uh, not everyone who should be at the table is at the table. What are we gonna do about this? Cause I only have one more hearing with you guys. And I, I, I don't, I, I wanna know that this is not gonna be a, an, a problem going forward. Yeah. And, and, and Chair Rose, as you know, you know, especially during um, the pandemic, we were doing weekly calls with providers. Our staff are speaking with providers daily. They're, they're getting emails. They're talking to providers daily. I, I, I Honestly, I don't know where that comes from. Um, part of me wants to say perhaps it's providers not receiving the response they want and wanting us to look into it further to see if the response changes. And then that becomes a delay, but I we speak to staff daily about the communication with providers. We get emails. The one thing I can say, look, any, any provider reaching out that doesn't get a response in a day or two, you know, roll it up or include everybody on it. I don't have a problem with that either. I tell my staff that they're like, why did they reach out to you? I said, why does that matter? Let's get what they need done. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I, it's something that we, I'll talk about internally again with staff to see how often we get complaints about that, but yeah, I'm not, it's hard to tell why that's a sentiment from providers when we do have mm -hmm. daily communication um, yeah. across, I, across all of our units. I would really, I would really appreciate that because it is, just, it really is a recurring theme, and you know, it seems as if you know decisions are made in a vacuum. Um, DYCD is always touting how transparent and how inclusive they are, and I, I hear from the the you know providers something different. So um, maybe so, we should look at um, sometimes, the model, sometimes the model that we that that we're using to you know what maybe what the, that what that model looks like in terms of when when things are being said that everybody's at the table or, you know, whatever. Sometimes we, we'll definitely take a look at it. Sometimes it's a not understanding of what we just said, the policy. I, I you know, I have a thousand programs. We send something out or we say something, 800 get it, 200 don't. That 200 is a loud voice. Um, and then, the, and then if that's the case, folks should reach back out to us immediately, but that doesn't happen all the time and then it lingers and then we find out later on that, oh, you didn't understand that policy that we just released or that statement that we just released. But it's something that we should, we're going to look into, we're going to take ownership on and hopefully improve it. And, and I think also, um, maybe if it, you know, there, there's inclusion and there's inclusion. And um, one of the questions I asked you was about how much weight does um, the input that they give carry? And I think that's probably the issue, you know? So I think maybe if you kind of address that early on, you know, like this is advisory uh, or, you know, we're gonna do this by some kind of democratic process, but you know, you know what government is like, I, I don't know, but I think there needs to be some clear expectations established of, of what, you know, stakeholder input looks like and, and what, you know, the potential outcome of that input would could be. Because, you know, I don't want to keep going to the table thinking that, you know, I'm going to see some of the, the, the benefits of, you know, my conversation 
and, and that not happened. So I think maybe managing expectations uh, um, and establishing, you know, just how much weight, you know, their input will carry would, would probably go a long way. Okay. All right. Um, uh, council, are there any other questions for, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I would like to remind council members if they do have any questions to use the raised hand function in Zoom and um, keep your questions to at least two minutes. And seeing no other hands raised, we can move on to public testimony. At this time, Chair, we have concluded the second round of questions. And if you have any closing remarks to share with the administration before they're excused. Um, again, I just, I wanna thank you. You know, I wanna thank you for coming to this, the hearings and, um, and, and for being prepared uh, with in, you know with information for us this time and um, and I, I really would like to know um, I'd like some feedback on whether we could be a part of that transition document um, but I, I again I want to thank you uh, we've all been through some very you know difficult times and it's been one um, it's actually been very trying for everyone. And uh, I do really believe that everyone's doing the best that they can, you know, in circumstances that none of us really had a plan for. So I, I want to thank you for all your efforts to keep New York City, you know, running and our youth being served. Uh, and, and, you know, I just hope that some of the issues that we've revisited, that we visited through this committee can actually be resolved and, um, you know, because the, the main purpose is for our young people to be able to thrive and, um, and, and get, you know, the full benefits of, of what New York City has to offer. And we have to make, you know, we have the youth chair and the senior chair. These are two, um, two populations that New York City, if they don't, recognize how important they are, um, we're going to really suffer um, the consequences. So um, I want to thank you all for taking, you know, the time today to come and, um, and testify. Um, and uh, Deputy Director Ryan, thank you. Um, you know, we give, we, you know, in the back rooms, MOX and OMB, uh, get a hard time. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for coming and answering our questions. And with that, um, we can have uh, uh, the, the public. And, and I wish that, you know, um, DYCD would leave someone to hear the providers um, because it's, it really isn't fair. You know, um, they come to every hearing and they go last and they have to listen. And, um, and, and sometimes, many times they don't agree with what's being said, um, but then DYCD doesn't have to stay and listen to hear what they're saying. So, so you don't have to hear it from me. Uh, someone needs to be here in the room now so that you can hear it from them. And Cheryl, we we always leave someone behind to hear the public. I know, poor and, Andrew, poor and, Andrew. Poor um, Andrew. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, I understand. You know, um, but sometimes I think so it, it's we, good. It's it's good for you know the commissioner level to to hear from them. I don't know how how un, uncensored they might speak to you in a. Um, in a, in a meeting uh, of stakeholders, you know, but here um, we usually, they usually speak very um, forthright and, um, and you get the message, at least I know I do. So thank you, you know, thank you. Well, thank you, Chair Rosen, thank you for your leadership.
Thank you, Chair. So I, we will now turn to public testimony. For public testimony, I will be calling individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and you will be called on after everyone on that panel has commit, completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the Sergeant at Arms will announce, will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. And after I call your name, please wait for a brief moment for the Council of, for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin. The next panelists, or our first panelists, will be in the following order. Daryl Hornick Becker from the Citizens Committee for Children, Dante Bravo from United Neighborhood Houses, and Christine James McKenzie of Jobs First New York City. Um, Daryl, you may begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Hornick Becker, and I'm a policy and advocacy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. I'd like to thank Chair Rose and all the members of the Youth Services Committee for holding today's hearing. For our full set of recommendations, I refer you to my written testimony. Today, I'll highlight just a few areas where action is needed in youth service contracts. First, universal year-round youth service programs start with a new RFP for providers. CCC and its partners in the Campaign for Children have long advocated for holistic, full year after school and summer programming with universal access. But such a system remains out of reach as long as the sector remains underfunded, understaffed, and hampered by contracts that only cover part of the year. It is well past time for a new RFP for these providers. DYCD and the new administration must issue a new RFP and make awards as soon as possible. And new contracts must include several components to ensure the stability of the sector and the high quality of programs. They should follow a budgeting model that includes cost escalators to address rising indirect costs, consistent cost of living adjustments for staff, COVID-19 related expenses, and a base per participant rate that ensures quality standards are met and wages are competitive. A new RFP should also be for 12 months of the year, not only to fund summer programs, but to allow providers to retain staff through the summer, onboard earlier for the fall, and support the months spent developing and planning after school programs. Second, the Summer Rising program would, re would require major reforms before continuing, and providers still need to be paid. Summer Rising's rollout presented providers with significant obstacles to its execution, including a lack of coordination between city agencies, confusing communication to families about enrollment, and insufficient CBO engagement during its development. Despite these challenges, providers were able to step up to ensure children and youth enjoyed the programs. And yet, Summer Rising providers still have not been paid for their efforts. Before any consideration can be made to continuing the program in future summers, DYCD, DOE, and the current administration must immediately pay all Summer Rising providers in full. If Summer Rising is to be considered for next summer or as a multiple year program, we have several recommendations based on feedback collected from Summer Rising providers. These include funding programs early and adequately, having a coordinated office to manage regulatory issues, pairing schools and CBOs in a thoughtful way, setting realistic enrollment targets and improving the enrollment process, ensuring staff safe staffing ratios, supporting children with IEPs, and of course, paying, paying providers on time. And finally, the city must improve the fingerprinting, fingerprinting and staff clearances process. Since the implementation of the comprehensive background check process in 2019, background check turnaround times for CBO staff working in youth serving programs has lagged, leading to staffing challenges and programs since before the pandemic. Funding cuts during the pandemic and labor shortages since, since have further exacerbated these challenges. The administration, DYCD, and DOHMH must collaborate effectively on the clearance process and allow providers to onboard staff in a new time, onboard new staff in a timely manner. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Dante Bravo, you may now begin. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose and members of the New York City Council for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dante Bravo, and I am a youth policy analyst at the United Neighborhood Houses, also known as UNH. UNH is a policy and social change organization that represents 45 neighborhood settlement houses, 40 of which are here in New York City, that reach 700, 765,000 New Yorkers from all walks of life. For full recommendations, please refer to our full written testimony. Um, I won't belabor the point that the toll of this pandemic will be with this generation of young people for years to come, but I do want to highlight that the disparate impacts on young people of color and low income young people threaten to widen already existing racial and economic gaps. In order for young people with high, uh, 
in order to provide young people with high quality services to combat many of these systemic barriers and to ensure the stability of the youth services field in a post-pandemic recovery, UNH recommends the city do the following. Pay overdue contracts immediately as well as commit to a faster contract payment process. As an acute example, none of the settlement houses who ran Summer Rising program have been paid as of today. This is nearly three months after program has ended and while providers are still uh, engaging with the demands of the field as we speak. Clear the backlog of comprehensive background checks as well as faster process, uh, uh, as well as create a faster process for background clearances in general. Increase rates across com Compass, Sonic, and Beacon contracts in the new request for proposals process, as well as a move towards a 12 month contract model that includes summer programming with planning for summer 2022 beginning no later than January 2022. Commit to consulting with CBOs and their coalitions to better inform the contract conditions that CBOs perform their work in and ensure that the nonprofit sector employees under contract with New York City are paid fair wages for their labor. It is especially important to ensure pay parity between human services workers and their city counterparts, as CBOs cannot provide wages to compete with agencies like the Department of Education, which incentivizes frontline staff to leave, these, leave for these jobs after CBOs have already trained, cleared, and developed these workers. Recently, settlement houses have reported that their staff have directly received recruiting emails from the DOE encouraging them to apply for substitute teacher positions. This indicates that on some level, the city recognizes the need for these workers and the quality of their work. Settlement House staff have described feeling as though they are merely a pipeline for city agencies to hire competent staff on a short notice. If the city can recognize the inherent value of their work, it is then unconscionable for the city to continue the practice of low contract reimbursement rates. Without immediate action, CBOs across the city will be put in a position that is impossible to run quality programming, and our city's young people will pay the highest price despite having survived the pandemic for the past year and a half. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify today. For more information or to answer any additional questions, you can reach me at ebravo at unh.org. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Christine James McKenzie, you may now begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon to the distinguished members of the Committee on Youth Services. My name is Christine James McKenzie, and I'm the Associate of Communications, Learning and Policy at Jobs First NYC, which is a nonprofit intermediary that creates and advances solutions to break down barriers and transform the system supporting young adults and their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. I think we all agree that New York City has to act swiftly to reduce the number of 18 to 24 year olds who are out of school and out of work and to connect these young adults to training, education and work opportunities, as well as advancing them along educational and career pathways. To this end, we would like to share the following recommendations for the city that were informed by a diverse coalition of young adult workforce development and education stakeholders, as well as 18 to 24 year olds. Um, the first is reconsider procurement requirements and design to encourage collaboration. By allowing and rewarding collaborative applications, funders can both incentivize partnerships and create access to city funding for smaller organizations that lack the capacity to provide a range of services on their own. Also reduce or eliminate administrative barriers to participant data sharing and encouraging data transparency. And this is something that we certainly believe is very important. When youth servicing agencies share relevant data on individual clients, they serve those clients more rapidly and effectively. Partner with young people in meaningful ways at all stages of designing, implementing, and evaluating initiatives and projects. They are smart. They know what they want and the direct input of these young adults can help surface needs and opportunities that might not be obvious to other stakeholders. It also highlights innovative approach for participant recruitment and service delivery, as well as provide unvarnished feedback 
on program effectiveness. We also suggest allowing flexibility for organizations to design programs that meet local needs. Individual cohorts of out of school, out of work youth with shared experiences may benefit from customized service delivery models. We thank you for your time and consideration. We appreciate this opportunity to testify and look forward to working with everyone who has taken the time out today to sit and have this discussion. Thank you, Chair Rose, um, to the council members who are here, the Youth Services Council, as well as the DYCD. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now turn to Chair Rose for questions for this panel. Thank you. Um, I want to thank each of you for your testimony. And, and I want to say, I, I want to say right now, I want to thank Associate Commissioner Rat Ray for, for staying because I really do believe that, you know, um, when you get a third hand, it doesn't have the same impact. Um, so I, I thank you for, for staying. Um, uh, uh, any one of you can answer this, but um, what percentage of an increase in youth providers contract in, in the contract reimbursement rate do you believe is necessary and reasonable? What would be a, a reasonable rate? Do, do any of you feel, do you, any of you have an idea? Uh, you don't have to if you, if you haven't I, thought about that. I can say when we were looking at summer rising um, and looking at model budgets and looking at what, based on providers, providers feedback, what they would actually need, we were looking at like 30 to 50% increases in rates, um, something significant. Um, I know that my partners at United Neighborhood Houses, who um, aren't on the call right now, uh, have looked at providers with model budgets, and we could definitely get back to you on more specific, but it would be a significant increase in terms of percentages. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I don't know if he's still here. Uh, he testified about sort of the pirating of, of, of youth workers um, to DOE. Um, and, and, and those jobs that they're being recruited for, do, do we have a sense of, of, of what the rate is or the rate of pay is? Um, a lot of the jobs are substitute jobs. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and as a stakeholder, you know, what role do you think um, you should play in the RFP process and and how how much weight do you think it, it should it should come you know you should have in the decision making For, going back to your question earlier chair rose um <laughs> uh, a lot of weight uh, providers should be <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm yeah. not surprised by that answer. <laughs> providers should be in constant consultation with the DYCD and the new administration on RFP, specifically on the rates, because the rates have to reflect the cost of services, they have to reflect the quality of programs, and they have to also directly solve problems the sector is facing, um, problems like wages, problems like retaining and hiring on and onboarding staff, and problems like clearances. So all of that needs to be part of a new RFP and a new process. And all of that only comes with engaging providers directly and before the RFP is actually released. Um, do you think that DYCD could better support or how, how would you like DYC to support the providers and advocates? Uh, Ms. McKenzie, Ms. James McKenzie or Mr. Honnick Becker, both of you can respond. Well, I will yield to uh, Mr. Hornick Becker primarily because we are an intermediary, so I oh, would not okay. be able to adequately speak to that. Um, okay. Okay. I, it, it starts with feedback and listening. Um, our CCC and the Campaign for Children have issued recommendations that include reforming the children's cabinet and constituting that with youth service providers themselves, so that when there is a new RFP for something like Compass and Sonic for something like summer programs, for something like SYEP or, or childcare, you have children and youth providers directly at the table informing those processes from the beginning to implementation, to rollout, to design, to enrollment. Um, so it starts there. I think it starts with direct feedback and really having them at the table from the beginning so that really would make the process easier 
from the start. And then there not, isn't going to be things like an RFP being rescinded because rates aren't high enough or, or as much delay once those RFPs do come out if you really have the, the providers at the table from the start. Okay, well, thank you. I thank you both um, for your testimony. Um, and uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I didn't ask um, at what stage your stakeholders are brought in. Uh, I, I think it's a, that's a great you know, um, place to start at, at the beginning instead of you know, after some of the decisions have been made. So um, thank you both for your testimony, council. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, I would like to remind council members who have questions for a particular panelist to use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on the panel once. Um, all right, well, seeing no hands raised, I believe we have completed or we have concluded public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order in which your hand is raised. I am now confirming that we do not have additional questions or additional test witnesses to testify or additional registrants. So at this point, I believe we have concluded public testimony for this hearing, Chair Rose. You are muted, I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, okay, well, um, that's a surprise and, and thank you. So Associate Commissioner, you got off really easy. Um, <laughs> usually the public testimony uh, really goes on a while. So um, again, I thank you for being here. And, and I, I thank our providers and our advocates who, um, who testified today. Um, I, I know that DYCD has heard loud and clear that it is really, there's a, a necessity to get the RFP done out and, you know, and re, you know, out and redistributed. Um, and, and that before you do that, that there needs to be input from you know, all the stakeholders and advocates so that um, we won't have to resend it. There is really an overarching need to make sure that the, the cost per participant is commiserate with what is, is actually needed, you know, to get the job done. Um, you know, I, I really do like the analogy of the one or. It, um, it shouldn't be. It, it, it shouldn't be. Um, we, we shouldn't even begin to look at uh, youth services um, with that type of jauntous eye that what can we get done with one or, you know, um, we should be starting from fully loaded and, um, and, and work out. So I, I want to thank you. I, I am going to follow up on um, the transition document. But I'm also um, going to have a conversation uh, in my exit interview uh, about how we we get the stakeholders to feel that you know they really are a part of the process, that their voices are heard, and um, and uh, and fight really hard to make sure that our young people are the priority. So I um, again I, I thank you. I thank you all for the providers and the and the service the service providers and advocates I thank you for your work it's it's thankless work um, and you know if DOE recognizes how important you are and that you should be compensated at a certain rate I know that um, DYCD um, knows um, it, I, I'm sure they have even more uh, of an idea of what your value is um, so, uh, we're going to work to sort of get all of these things to meet and, and there'll be some confluence. And uh, I thank you all. Um, and with that, this meeting is adjourned.